Welcome to Toastmasters Bay to Bay. We feature speakers from San Francisco to Monterey. Now, for those of you not familiar with the Toastmaster format, we are going to give you a presentation of a small part of a Toastmaster meeting featuring two speakers, an evaluator, and an interview portion. Our first speaker this evening has an objective to his speech, and that is to inspire. Please welcome our first speaker, Paul Bear. And the title of Paul's speech is, Here Comes Trouble. Paul? Here comes trouble. Again? Oh, but wait. It seems to have left a gift. Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters and guests, would it change the way you look at trouble if you knew it always came with a gift? Not just a, oh, thank you for playing gift in a box with a little duct tape <laughs> bow, but a gift that was somehow more than the measure of the trouble that it brought. This is what I believe, and I am here to share with you three practices that I believe will help you get the gifts your trouble brings. The first is you must start with your heart. This means that you ask, what is it that I want in this moment right here? And this is simple, but much harder than it sounds, because we're not used to looking in there and asking that question. And you can be fooled. You can think, oh, well, what I want in my heart is that European vacation, you know, or that car. No, that's not the sort of thing that comes from here. That comes from up here. So you need to ask and learn to listen in your heart. What is it I want? And then hold that focus. Don't let it go. If you can hold that focus, and go about the next few things that you're doing, it will transform what you're doing. So starting with heart is two things. One, know what you want, and two, hold the focus while it happens. If you can hold the focus on your heart's desire in the heat of conflict, that is a gift all by itself. The second practice is to pop your mental balloon. When conflict arises, your brain goes into hyperdrive, and you think of all the things that are wrong with the other person's argument, and all the things that are beautiful and just and kind about your own. And it starts out small, but then it begins to grow. And you talk to people, and you get stories and, and references, and pretty soon, with all the justifications, it's looking, whoa, mama, look what I made. But it's mostly hot air. It was invented by a brain influenced by fear and anger. Garbage in, garbage out. Pop the balloon. Cut it loose. Go ahead then and recreate something with better inputs, with a calm mind. So the second prescription is to pop your mental balloon. But work on your own, not anyone else's. The third one is you must go in with your defenses down. This flies in the face of everything we learned, including some things that come from our own gut, and it works. It is a powerful position to have your defenses and to let them go. From here, you can speak about that thing you found in your heart. From here, you can be truly curious about what's going on over there. And if you can keep your defenses down, it makes it safe for the other party to do so. And now your heart has another heart in the conversation. And that is a gift. About 14 years ago, I got two phone calls, one from the school, one from the police. My son had brought a knife to school, and zero tolerance, he was expelled and arrested in the same motion. I was called in there, and I had to go get him, and when I went to get him, they told me, because he had been in trouble with the police the year before, one more time, and he would become a ward of the state. I was furious. I was embarrassed. I was afraid. I thought, I'm going to lose my son. His life is at risk, and I and cannot control him. When we got home, though, I stopped and looked in my heart. And what I found there was I didn't want to control him. I wanted him to control himself, to be well, to thrive, to have the advantages I tried to provide. That is all. Then, the balloon. Oh, my God. I had a balloon that you could give rides at the county fair. 
so big and beautiful years in the making. And I already knew it did not serve. It was easy for me to pop that balloon. Next, I went into the conversation with my defenses down. Son, I am not going to try and control you anymore. That's your job. I will tell you when I see good things coming or bad things coming your way, and it's up to you what you will do about it. The consequences you get are yours, and some of them will come through to me. And that's okay because I'm the dad. Now it took a couple of months for him to really get that I meant it. And when he did, he turned his life around on a dime. And the things he did so far surpassed anything I could have imagined. And that is such a gift. So folks, are you thinking you want one of these? Practice, practice, starting with your heart. Practice popping your own balloons. And practice going into conversations with your defenses lowered. Become skilled. And now here comes trouble. Why don't you go out and see what it's got for you? Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Paul, tell us the name of your home club. I'm with Amadan Valley Orators. And what inspired you to join Toastmasters 10 years ago? Oh, well, 10 years ago, there was a woman I was interested in who told me about her Toastmasters club, and I went to visit. And how'd that go? It didn't go the way I planned, but it went quite well, and I really enjoyed Toastmasters. Now, I heard that about seven years ago, you were a Toastmaster at a speech contest. Is that true? Oh, yes, that's the truth. And, good and you got very fascinated with one of the contestants. Is that true? Oh, yes. Well, she gave a speech about dating, and when I interviewed her, I flirted with her. And how'd that go? That went really well. Really? How well? Yeah, I married her a few wow, years later. Wow, a few years later. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. That's great. That's great. Now, tell me, what is the greatest benefit in your personal life to being a Toastmaster? Mm, the opportunity to get up and speak what's on my mind mm -hmm. is a wonderful thing to me. Mm -hmm. And the people you meet, not just the ones you marry, mm -hmm. are... are <laughs> are really wonderful people. Everybody is trying to improve themselves. You get to participate, and they help you with your growth. And have you noticed an increase in commitment among your, your uh, members of your club to improve themselves? Oh, yes. The partnership? Yes. And then you, when you're in a club for a long while, it's really easy to see the benefits of That's Toastmasters. That's great. And Toastmasters has both communication and leadership opportunities. What do you do in the area of leadership opportunities? Oh, well, usually I go back here. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I do. <laughs> and I have been president of my club. I have been the vice pres president of education. That's great. I've had uh, vice president of PR. So I've tried several of the roles. Thank you, Paul. You're welcome. And as I mentioned in the beginning, every speaker has an evaluator. So evaluating Paul's speech is Susan Schwartz. Susan is a charter member of her club, Pro Toasties. That's right. And anything else? Um, How many people have you met in Toastmasters? Well, I've met a ton of people, but I haven't married any oh, of them. Oh, wow. <laughs> All right, Susan, please. Thank you. <laughs> Paul, I loved the speech, and I really did. And that's not something I usually tell speakers, so you know that I mean it. I, what I loved about it was it was very clear. It was very easy to follow. I love the part that the story came from your experience. It was heartfelt. It was genuine. It was authentic. And when you told it, I felt that you were giving us the benefit of your real life experience, which made it valuable. I think what, tr what would increase the value of the speech would be if you would bring the story more up front. So you said, here comes trouble. And then right away, here's how to, here's how to answer it. Here's how to find the gift in the trouble. And it was as if you were speaking from an intellectual point, uh, point of view rather than that deep experience. I was waiting for that story. And when you brought that story in, the whole speech expanded for me because I knew that you had experienced trouble 
and I knew what that meant to you, and I knew that the prescription you were giving us wasn't just coming out of a place in your head, it was coming out of your really deep experience. So that would be the most profound thing I think that you, you could do that would really change the, the impact of this speech would be to open with that story. Here comes trouble. Boy, did I have trouble in my life. One day, my son came home. And I, you know, I got this phone call. He brought a knife to school. He was going to be arrested. And that wasn't the first time. So really give us that sense of the weight of the trouble on your shoulders. And instead of just giving us the prescription, give us that sense in the moment, here's what I had to do in order to face it. I had to, I had to uh, start with my heart. And so, you know, then instead of just giving us the one, two, three, weave your points through the story. And that way, you'll tie the story to the message, which will give us more impact. The other thing I wanted to speak to you about is your vocal quality. You have this very gentle, warm, loving, approachable voice. But I'd like to hear sometimes a little bit more weight in it, especially when you're talking about trouble. Here comes trouble. I want to feel the impact that trouble has and, and, and hear it in your voice as well as hear about it. Overall, really well. Really good job. Thank you, Susan. Our next speaker is Steve Delaporta. He's also known as the Magic Man, and the title of his speech is Leadership Magic. Steve Delaporta. Warren Bennis, the chairman of the Leadership Institute of University of Southern California, says, managers do things right. Leaders do the right things. Management comes from the Latin word manu, meaning hand. Leadership is action. Action is movement. Movement is direction. Leaders move things forward. Managers handle things. So when we hear the term leader or leadership, all of us form a mental image in our mind of someone we know, someone whom we consider a leader. So frame that image in your mind right now. Think of that person. Get that picture square in your mind. Now, when we think of that leader whom we know, we also think of some characteristic about them, something that we say, when they do that, that's why I call them a leader. Think of that characteristic. You see, leadership characteristics flow along several types. There are behavioral types, like a director, a relator, a socializer, a thinker. And then there are the types that are more like being an introvert, being an extrovert, being a perceiver or a judger. But the problem with leadership characteristics is it's very much like taking a square peg and putting it in a round hole. It reminds me of what Big Al's view of life is. See, Big Al says, life, too many people go through life treating it like they're a five-ton truck. So actually, when we take leadership characteristics and grind them into other people, we're imposing on them something that may not be who they are. So let me share with you a little bit about me. I'm originally from New York. I went to Catholic Grammar School and Cardinal Spellman High School in the Bronx on a scholarship. And at the age of 16, my father and I had a disagreement about a haircut. <laughs> the disagreement turned into an argument. The argument turned into a fight. At the age of 16, in the middle of February, during a snowstorm, I was put out of my house with an overcoat, a carry bag, and 16 cents. I lived on the streets for over two years. I traveled the eastern seaboard. I offloaded Russian fishing trawlers in Florida. I worked at an offset printing plant in New Britain, Connecticut, the home of Stanley Tools. I did street performances. I did odd jobs. I did many, many different things just to try to stay alive. And finally, my father and I reconciled, and I returned home. I returned to high school, and I ended up enlisting in the United States Marine Corps. And after I enlisted, I stayed in the Marine Corps. I went through the enlisted ranks to the officer ranks over 21 years before retiring. Now, both of those periods in my life taught me something about leadership. One, 
Leadership is about a belief system you carry inside yourself. Because when you're cold and you're hungry and you don't have a place to call home, you have to believe in yourself in order to keep moving forward. And two, leadership is about action. It's not about books. It's not about theory. It's not even about perfection. It's about action. You have to do in order to learn how to do. Too often, we become afraid of the doing. We get into our perfectionistic mindset because inside all of us, there is an assistant or an assassin. It's that little voice in the back of our heads. I don't know what you call yours. It could be the id. It could be the ego. It could be your critical voice. It could be the judge. Mine is Sister Josepha. <laughs> <laughs> now, Sister Josepha, she's jammed up in here. OK. Sister Josepha was my fourth grade teacher. Now, she only stood five feet tall, but in fourth grade, she towered over all of us, and she became my not enough voice in my head. You are not good enough. You are not strong enough. You are not tall enough. You are not smart enough. You are not quick enough. If there was a not enough in my life, Sister Josepha was there to point it out. <laughs> but you see, Sister Josepha is only part of a whole. She's not the whole judge. She's not the whole jury. She's a part of me. She did good things for me. She's that same voice in my head that says, don't stick your finger in an electric socket. When the light is red, stop. When the light is green, go. When the light is yellow, hurry up through the intersection. So I thank Sister Josepha for what she adds. But I don't let her become the preeminent voice inside my head. A. H. Holmes, the founder of the, spirit, the Diamond Approach to Spiritual Psychology, says, in order to get a true understanding of who we are, we have to do something that questions the underlying belief about ourselves. And someone who did that was a young man by the name of Stan Cottrell. Stan Cottrell grew up poor in the backwoods of Kentucky. As a matter of fact, it wasn't until he was in his 20s that he even saw a flush toilet. But one day at the age of five, after an afternoon rainstorm, he stood in a field with his father, watching this arching rainbow come across the sky. And he took his father's hand and he said, Daddy, one day I'm going to wrap my arms around the end of that rainbow. Now Stan had very little going for him, but he did like to run. And in the last 30 years, he's run over 135,000 distance miles. He's run across America. He's run across Europe. And based on a personal goal, he ran the Great Wall of China. Now, when Stan first had the idea of running the Great Wall of China, he thought it would take him six months, maybe a year, to get everything in place. But it was the 1980s. We were still in a Cold War. It took him over five years. He had to get permission from the US State Department. He had to get permission from the People's Republic of China. He had to get permission from the Chinese Sports Agency. He had to get 50 letters of referrals from congressmen and senators. He had to raise hundreds of thousands of dollars, and he had to build a support team. And he approached 1,900 individuals and corporations, and he was turned down 1,858 times. But he persisted. And finally, he had the funding, he had the team, he had the permissions, and he went off to China. And he ran 2,125 miles across the navigable portion of the Great Wall of China. He ran the equivalent of 40 miles a day for 53 consecutive days. He ran through all types of weather. He ran 1,000 of those miles with two cracked vertebrae. And he went from 140 pounds to 125. And Stan Cottrell found something profound. He found that when everything we have as a reference point has been taken away and can no longer be depended upon, we come to the moment of truth within ourselves. See, Stan Cottrell found that he had spent his entire life running to a destination. He had never been in a destination. And he felt all of us are looking outside of ourselves instead of looking within ourselves. And everything we need is already inside of ourselves. Stan Cottrell found that there are eight gifts that we carry that constitute who we are. And those eight gifts constitute who we are as leaders. Because leadership is an evolution. It's a journey of self. 
It's an expression of who we are. Those eight gifts are reverence. Reverence which we give to ourself first. We're the sandbox within which we practice. And then having given it to ourself, we give it to others. And then there's respect. Once again, we give it to ourselves. We distill it inside, and when we squeeze, it comes out toward others. And then there's kindness. How often are we kind to a hurt animal or a crying child, but we forget to be kind to ourselves? So we put the kindness inside of ourselves, and then we're blinder and kinder to everyone around us. And then there's gentleness. And Max Ehrman's poem, Desiderata, says, Beyond the wholesome discipline, be gentle with yourself. Be gentle with yourself. And then gentle to everyone else. And then there's patience. Boy, patience is the oil that takes the friction out of life. You know, patience is the counting down before we blast off. But patient to ourselves first, like Ralph Waldo Emerson said, adopt the pace of nature. Her secret is patience. Farmers know they can't sow and reap in the same day. Be patient with yourself and patient with others. And then there's the elusive quality of humility. Humility is one of those things that the minute you think you have it, you've lost it. <laughs> <laughs> During a leadership workshop one time, a fellow came up to me to tell me how proud he was of the humility he'd been practicing. <laughs> it's kind of on the right idea, but missing the point a little bit. And then, of course, there's sincerity. Sincerity is the face of our soul. It's our face in every direction, and we know if we're being sincere or not. And our foundational quality is integrity, without which the other qualities aren't even as strong. Integrity is what Shakespeare said in Hamlet, to thine own self be true, and therefore that cannot be false to any man. And at 3 o'clock in the morning, when it's too late to call anyone here, and it's not early enough to call anyone on the East Coast, we know if we're operating from a place of integrity or a place of ego. You see, these eight gifts are the foundation of who we become as people and who we become in our connection to other people. And leadership is an expression of who we are. Leadership is all about relationships. We can practice these gifts, but we also have to practice them with other people. And that's the challenge. Because as Connie Podesta said, life would be easy if it wasn't for the other people in it. But we're not much of a leader if we're not able to interact and build our relationships with other people. And so we have to learn how to do that. So we've got our gifts. We've got our eight gifts. We're practicing along. We're working on it. And we still have moments when maybe there's confusion. Maybe there's misunderstanding. Maybe there's conflict. And at that time, we can follow the advice of General George Marshall, who was Secretary General of the Army during World War II and Secretary of State afterwards, when he said he had a three-step formula for handling people. And it's a very simple formula. It's one. Listen to the other person. Two, listen to the other person's full story. Three, listen to the other person's full story first. So if we're willing to listen, if we're willing to offer them the respect and the reverence, the sincerity, the humility, the patience, the kindness, the gentleness, and the integrity, and listen to their story first, we can be the catalyst to minimize those conflicts. Because what we're doing is exercising our leadership. We're expressing ourselves. And our expression is creating a role model for others. The only thing that keeps us from moving forward is a little bit of that fear to try it. But James Cousins, Professor Emeritus at USC, tells us, success is a result of good judgment. Good judgment is the result of experience. And experience is the result of bad judgment. <laughs> we need to try those things and make the mistakes so we can learn. And then we can face the last fear. And the last fear was quoted by Nelson Mandela when he, he accepted being president of South Africa. And he quoted Marianne Williamson in 1994 when he said, Our greatest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our greatest fear is that we are powerful beyond all measure. So I encourage you to accept your power to take on your role, 
to express your gifts, to be the leader you already are. And the next time someone asks you to think of a leader you know, make sure the first person you think of is you. And remember, the magic is already within us. Mr. Toastmaster. Now, Steve, tell us the name of your Toastmaster home club. It's uh, Surf City Advanced Toastmasters in Santa Cruz. And what inspired you to join Toastmasters? Uh, an ad in the paper. I wanted to practice speaking. There was an ad that said there was a Toastmaster club. I said, let's go see what they're doing. And have you married anyone in your club? No, no I actually haven't. Paul was already taken when I met him. <laughs> <laughs> now, I heard, I heard that you do a mean card trick. Well, actually, I, I'm actually a magician. I do often incorporate magic into my presentations. So. Do we get to see it? Not tonight. No. We have to go to Sun City. You, Surf City. Surf City. We have to Santa go to Surf Cruz. City. Surf City. Card trick. Yeah. Now, I also heard that you're a radio, you do radio? Yeah, you every Saturday radio? night, Saturday night uh, uh, for three hours, six to nine, out of the Monterey area, the Central Coast. Uh, so you're a DJ? Uh, no, actually, it's a talk show with really? my wife. My wife and I do it. It's Good Vibrations Radio That's Tools great. for Transformation. That's wonderful. How long have you been doing that? Two years. And, and how's that going? It's going very well. Now, do you think your Toastmaster experience helped you? Yes, actually both. One of the things that I found for radio, I think the radio made my pausing better in my presentations, mm -hmm. but my Toastmaster experience gave me the courage to go ahead and try the radio. So, wow, <laughs> that's great. Yeah. And you, I, I know I've seen you do magic in your presentations. Mm -hmm. Is that common for you to do that? Do you travel to a lot of places yes. and do that? Yes. And are, so are you a performing magician? Can I go to like a comedy club and see you? I've or never a magic been to, club? I've, I've actually never been to a comedy club, but yes, you could go to a magic club or uh, I definitely do performances and mostly around starting in this part of the year, the second half of the year. We also uh, read palms. <gasps> oh, you don't want to read that palm. No, I don't. Uh, all right. Well, <laughs> you can keep that one. All right. Thank you, Steve <laughs> Delacorta. <laughs> about Toastmasters, the opportunities available to you, a club near you, and the fun you can have in both communication and leadership opportunities. I have to say I love Toastmasters, and I think the work of Toastmasters is brilliant. What I'd like for you is for you to have the same enjoyment of Toastmasters. So thank you for being with us this evening. I hope you enjoyed this opportunity. Beyond that, I think if you go to places like our website, the Toastmaster International website, and other